May 2nd, 1863, in the height of the Civil War, General A.D. Strait of the Union Army came through this area. He was burning and pillaging his way to Rome, Georgia. But right in his tracks, following closely behind, was General Nathan Bedford Forrest. When General Forrest arrived at Black Creek, which is where we're standing right now, he realized that Strait's army had burned the bridge and there was no way for him to cross the creek. He feared it would take several hours to find a place and to get all his men to the other side. As luck would have it, the bridge was near the Sansom family farm. Young Emma Sansom volunteered to help General Forrest find a way across the creek. She jumped on back of his horse and led him to a ford, a shallow place in the creek where he was able to get all his men across to the other side. General Forrest commended her for her bravery, asked for a locket of her hair, then led his men on in his pursuit of General Strait. It was the spring of 1863. Union Colonel Abel Strait had engineered a plan to destroy railroads and disrupt supply lines in both Alabama and Georgia in hopes of stopping the refortification of Confederate troops in Tennessee. Colonel Strait departed from Nashville, Tennessee with a force 2,000 men strong. They traveled by riverboat to Eastport, Mississippi, then began marching toward the east. Their route took them through Tuscumbia, Russellville, Moulton, and Bluntsville before coming through Gadsden on the way to Rome, Georgia. In the meantime, Confederate General Braxton Bragg had learned of Colonel Strait's plan, so he gathered up the fiercest horsemen in the Confederate Army and put them under the command of General Nathan Bedford Forrest. The orders given to Forrest and his men were specific. Stop Strait's mule brigade before they reach Rome, Georgia. April 30th saw the first of many running gun battles between the two forces. Forrest had managed to catch the Union force completely by surprise, but with each skirmish, Strait's forces would be on the run again before Forrest could even establish a dismounted battle line. On the morning of May 2nd, 1863, Strait and his men set their sights on Gadsden. After crossing Black Creek, Strait's men burned the old wooden bridge that was the only way across the creek. Strait was hoping to delay General Forrest long enough to rest and feed his weary men and their horses. This is where a young Emma Sansom enters the story and takes her place in Civil War history. Emma was the daughter of Mikaja and Lamila Van Sansom. The Sansom family had come to Gadsden from Georgia in 1852. They farmed their land and were well thought of and respected in the community. On the morning of that historical day, young Emma had just returned from town when Colonel Strait's mule brigade arrived at the Sansom family farm. Union soldiers searched the family home and found Emma's brother Rufus, who was at home recovering from injuries received in battle. Rufus was quickly taken prisoner by the Union soldiers. It was then that Strait's army made their hasty getaway and burned the bridge in their path. When Forrest arrived, he was greeted by the Sansom women who were still grieving over the capture of Rufus. The women informed the general of the events of the morning and that the bridge had been destroyed. The nearest bridge for the Confederate Army to cross was about two miles away, but Emma said she knew of a place nearby where the cows crossed the creek. Emma offered to saddle up her horse and show the general, but he responded that there was no time to saddle a horse and he boosted Emma up behind him on his horse, all the time assuring Emma's mother that he would bring her home safely. Emma led General Forrest through a field to a small branch protected by thick undergrowth. The branch emptied into Black Creek just above a fort. By this time, Emma and the general were under fire from a rear guard that Strait had left behind to watch the creek. So Emma pointed out the crossing and they headed back toward the house. The battle became so fierce that General Forrest left young Emma in a safe hiding place. When the fighting subsided, Emma started back toward home and ran into General Forrest again. The general asked for a lock of her hair and asked a special favor of the Sansom family. One of Forrest's men, Robert Turner, had been killed in the fighting. General Forrest asked if Turner could be buried in a nearby graveyard where Emma's father was buried. Now, more than 140 years later, the two graves are still there in a small fenced-in plot that sits in the middle of a busy modern highway. General Forrest requested of the Sansom family that Private Turner be buried in their family cemetery, and he still remains there today, although the family cemetery is right in the middle of a major highway. 
the markers are still here to commemorate his loss. Most people think that Emma Sansom's buried here, but she's not. It is the Sansom family cemetery and her father is buried here. Emma Sansom after the Civil War moved to Texas though, and that's where she's buried with her family in Texas. General Forrest and his small band of soldiers eventually caught up with Colonel Strait and his raiders before they made it to Rome. And they bluffed the much larger Union force into surrender. As for Emma, she married a man named Christopher B. Johnson in October of 1864. They lived in Gadsden for several years before ultimately moving to Texas and settling near Gilmer in Upshur County. There they raised five sons and two daughters. Christopher died in 1887 and Emma never remarried. She died on August 9th in 1900 and is buried in Little Mound Cemetery about 12 miles west of Gilmer, Texas. When Dwight Manufacturing came to Alabama City in 1895, they built more than just a cotton mill. They built an entire community. The incorporation of Alabama City in 1891 began the process of bringing industrial prospects to the area. At the time, the area was mainly populated by a few families with one small store owned by Frank Canterbury. Canterbury was the first merchant in the area and his store met the basic needs of the locals. It was Colonel R.B. Kyle who gave the town of Alabama City its first industry when he built the Kyle Furniture Company on the banks of Black Creek. Colonel Kyle set his efforts toward attracting a major industry to the area. His efforts were successful and it was soon announced that Dwight Manufacturing Company would construct a cotton mill in the small Creekside town. Dwight Manufacturing was a successful company based in the north, but with increased tightening of labor laws and a strengthening presence of unions, the company was looking to expand in the south. Alabama City was the favored choice of Dwight Manufacturing officials due to the donation of some land and the town's convenient access to railroad and river transportation. The announcement of Dwight Manufacturing would prove to be a pivotal point in the history of Alabama City. When Dwight Manufacturing began construction of its massive 957,000 square foot brick building, hundreds of skilled carpenters and masons converged on Alabama City looking to find work on the project. The mill was constructed on a large parcel of land known as Dwight City, which was later to become part of Alabama City. It took several months to complete construction of the main building and several additions were added later. The Dwight Manufacturing Cotton Mill construction project represented a $1.2 million investment by the company and brought about the first economic boom to the Alabama City economy. The newly built mill provided about 800 jobs and attracted its labor force from the area's poor farmers and sharecroppers seeking to improve their living standards. Along with this influx of workers came a need for good housing. At the same time the mill was being constructed, the company was also building homes in anticipation of the large workforce. The epicenter of this activity was known simply as the Mill Village. Dwight Manufacturing took great pride in providing comfortable housing for its workers, with each home offering a spacious yard and an area for a small garden. The mill homes were well constructed and rent was usually based on the number of rooms. Back then, the going rate was usually a dollar per month per room. Eventually, around 2,000 people called the Mill Village home. But the housing provisions for mill workers were not there solely as a benefit for employees. There was a bit of an ulterior motive as well. Company-provided housing was also an effective tool in curbing support for union organization. Since the company owned the houses, they could simply evict any workers that were stirring up union sympathies. The threat of losing a job and a home was plenty of reason to keep quiet. By the early 1900s, Alabama City was growing at a rapid pace and an expansion at the mill had created a robust population increase. This growth spurred more opportunities for the town. A small metropolis was beginning to take shape and one of the town's founders, Captain James M. Elliott Jr., even applied for a post office to serve the needs of the growing area. Alabama City was the first city in the state to have a free lending public library. The beautifully columned structure is one of the few landmarks of that era that is still standing today. The library was built in 1898 and it was named in honor of the late Howard Gardner Nichols who had been killed in an accident at the mill. 
Nichols had served as Dwight Manufacturing's local general manager, or agent as they were called back then, during construction of the mill. He also served as one of the early mayors of Alabama City. History recalls Howard Gardner Nichols as a devout Christian man who encouraged his employees to attend church services that were held in the cloth room of the mill. Services were held in the mill until 1900. That's when the company built a permanent church building in which the congregations could meet. The building was known as the Union Church and different denominations of believers would share the building by holding services on alternating weeks. The church was designed in the European Alpine style and the stained glass windows were placed in the church by Howard Gardner Nichols' sister as a memorial to her brother. The first Alabama City church to have its own building was the Dwight Baptist Church. Parishioners had originally held meetings in a room above the company store, but thanks to a land grant and a substantial amount of money donated by the company, the Dwight Baptist Church would hold its building dedication on September 29th of 1901. Recreation also played a key role in Mill Village life, and Dwight Manufacturing sponsored a multitude of activities. The company built a bathhouse on the lake with separate facilities for men and women. Rowing, fishing, and swimming were just some of the fun activities with which employees and their families would fill their leisure time. Dancing was another favorite pastime, and an open-air pavilion located in a wooded area near the mill provided the perfect setting where the company brass band could be heard playing popular tunes of the day for a crowd of dancers. Some evenings you could find a crowd gathered at the bowling alley. Bowling was one of the few recreational activities that could be enjoyed after dark since the mill had made sure that the bowling alley had electricity. It was even attended by pen boys. Another form of entertainment that became popular because of electricity was the movie theater. Several theaters made their way to Alabama City over the years. One of the most popular was the Palace Theater, which burned down in the mid-1920s at a time when movies were only 10 cents. The most notable theater in Alabama City was the Ritz Theater on Wall Street. The Ritz hasn't been used as a movie theater for many years, but it is still used on a regular basis by the Theater of Gadsden, a local community theater group that puts on several productions a year in the old theater. Baseball fans in Alabama City didn't have to go very far to enjoy America's favorite pastime. The Dwights were a baseball team that was very popular with local fans. While it wasn't quite the major leagues, some of the players were treated a bit like celebrities. The team's better ball players got the best jobs in the mill and preferential treatment by area merchants. Alabama City's baseball field was known as Dwight Park. Dwight Park was located on the banks of Black Creek and featured a covered grandstand and seating for about 500 spectators. As Alabama City grew, other industries began to take notice of the area's rich natural resources and the easy access to a skilled labor force. In the early 1900s, the Southern Steel Company would locate a steel plant in the area. Although the steel giant was located in the confines of Alabama City, it was officially in the corporate limits of the city of Gadsden. The company produced its first run of steel in 1904. With the steel mill now in production, Alabama City would again see a period of significant job growth, but the new jobs soon put a strain on the available labor force. Unfortunately, it was not uncommon to see children filling the need for laborers. From the beginning, Alabama City made every effort to provide for the education of its younger children. But when Dwight Manufacturing came to town, a school system devoted to the education of children of all ages would begin to take shape. Alabama City already had a couple of schools. In the late 1890s, the first Dwight Elementary School had been built on the corner of Peachtree Street and Dwight Avenue. It was originally a simple one-story wood building. A second story was added a few years later, and a three-building middle school facility on Lakefront Avenue soon followed. There was, however, no high school located in Alabama City. From the beginning, Dwight Manufacturing recognized the benefit of having a well-educated workforce, so they offered several forms of education for workers and their families. It didn't take long for the student population to outgrow the town's available facilities, so in 1926, the Elliott School was built. Elliott School was a second grammar school for Alabama City and was named for Captain James M. Elliott, Jr., one of the founders of Alabama City. Elliott School was in use until 1977. 
By the late 1920s, plans were finally in the works to build a senior high school for Alabama City. The Alabama City Board of Education had $60,000 on hand to acquire some land and to build the new high school. In the end, the total cost would just exceed $80,000. The land obtained by the school board was once the family farm of Civil War heroine Emma Sansom, and it was decided that the new high school would bear her name as a lasting memorial to her bravery and heroism. Emma Sansom High School first opened its doors to students of Alabama City in January of 1929. Her first graduating class received their diplomas in 1931, and the first person to graduate from Emma Sansom High School, by virtue of alphabetical order of course, was Earl Clayton. Emma Sansom High School's first few years were difficult. The Great Depression put Alabama City deeply in debt, and there was little money to pay policemen and firemen, much less teachers and school officials. Over the years, the city of Gadsden had extended numerous invitations to Alabama City, asking them to become part of Gadsden. Heavily in debt and with future prospects looking bleak, Alabama City leaders decided to finally accept the annexation invitation from Gadsden. With an overwhelming vote by its citizens, Alabama City officially became part of Gadsden in 1932. It was in that same year that the Emma Sansom Rebels played their first football game against the Gadsden High Tigers. That first game ended in favor of the Tigers, but it started a storied rivalry that would burn as hot as the blasting furnaces at the local steel mill. From the first game in 1932 to the final game 72 years later in 2004, the Rebels and the Tigers were bitter enemies. We used to pray at the pep rallies for them. We have a moment of silent prayer before our game for yeah, them. Yeah, but at their place and their new gym, yeah. and they were throwing how to sell them back to Black Creek. Uh, uh. <laughs> I, I used to hear that in my sleep, man. Yeah. And again, man, I, I... We were raised as Rebels in Purple and Gold. You know, we were like Kelly Gross, I think, Buster's daughter one time told me that her dad made them hold their nose when they went by gas and pie. They couldn't even smell the air. Yeah. Like, you, know. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, the first words, most kids learn with mom and dad. But in Alabama City, the first word you learn was hate kids. My, all my girls attended kids in high school due to the zone they were in. Right. And uh, of course, they, we were big rivalries yeah. between my three girls and myself all those years. Heck, we, we, we were rivalries. We had to play them in ping pong, you know, <laughs> That's as far right. as that was That's concerned. Right. But, you come in there, he'll really bring that team in there. He knew. Yeah. He knew he had to bring his lunch pail. It's gonna be it's gonna be war. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, we went to hear our parents talk about it, how, you know, they just couldn't wait to play guys at home and you know, just wanted to beat them so bad and we'd go to their school, they'd come to our school <laughs> and do our old pranks, but yeah, but that's what I think that's what made it fun, just having that rivalry. If you grew up in Alabama City, you know, you, you're just a natural hate for getting us. <laughs> Early on, when we would be out driving, we couldn't go down Chester. And if we had to go down Chester, and I did a lot of that with my uphill and downhill driving, parking with a curb and without a curb down mm -hmm. that little hill. And if I had to use that or chose to use it, uh, we passed by there, we couldn't look over there. My whole life growing up, I mean, Emma Sansom was, was law in my that's house. It, that's I mean, right, that's right. Yeah, I mean, everybody, anybody that lived in Alabama City or on the mountain, I mean, they couldn't wait. Your dream was to play for Emma Sansom. As Coach Troop said, it was your dream to play at Emma Sansom. Those words rang true for many athletes over the years who have showcased their skills on the football fields, baseball fields, and in the gymnasiums around the area. Those words rang true for me on a personal level as my dad played basketball and baseball at Emma Sansom in the early 60s. I'm a four-year baseball letterman myself, playing from 1983 to 1986. Emma Sansom High School has always been synonymous with athletic excellence. The Emma Sansom Athletic Department is no stranger to state championships. Over the 75-year history of the school, the Rebels won three baseball championships, two football championships, and one basketball championship. One of those football championships came under head coach Buster Gross in 1984. The state championship game, that moment when that last second kicked up, yeah. was the 
probably the greatest thing. When Coach Gross arrived at Emma Sansom in the late 60s, football wasn't the big and successful sport that it would eventually become. With perseverance, some patience, and a lot of hard work, Coach Gross turned an ailing football program into a winner. And I knew if you could be good in everything except football, you could be good in football. As is the case with any athletic program, the Rebel football team had its share of ups and downs over the years. But Coach Gross says he could always tell what kind of year it was going to be. In all my coaching years, when I lost the first game, I had a losing season. If I won the first game, I always had a winning season. The Rebel basketball team earned their state championship under the guidance of Coach George Baker. Coach Baker led the Sansom Boys basketball program for 35 years. His success is not only measured in terms of wins and losses, but also in the continued success of his players. There was 39, 39 players that played under me to receive scholarships. And out of the 39, uh, I think 11 went to Division I schools. Wow. A couple of those players even came back home to Emma Sansom and became successful coaches in their own right. 1989 graduate Kevin Troop had the unique honor of playing for Coach Baker, serving as an assistant under Coach Baker, and then was chosen as his replacement upon his retirement, a position he held until consolidation. It's almost like Barry Bryant said, Mama called. Yeah. And I got that call from Coach Harris. I was sitting in my office at UAB one day, and he said, Kevin, he said, uh, we want you to come coach football and be the B-team basketball coach and, um, you know, things go as planned, go well. You know, when Coach Baker steps down, we want you to be the head coach. And, you know, I, you're sitting there at that point in your career, you've just completed your master's, you want to move on and be a college coach. And then here you are, your ex-football coach is telling you to come be a B-team basketball coach. <laughs> right. You know, but I did it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I wouldn't have done it anywhere else but here at Sanson. In his 35-year tenure with the Rebels, George Baker had set the bar high, and Coach Troop knew he had some big shoes to fill. First of all, of course, the game stands out most in my mind as the coach as your first game. Yeah. You know, I mean, the butterflies were just unbelievable when we coming back here, and it's my first game. We played Pell City, and um, I mean, I was so nervous, I, and the kids didn't know it. They came on up and started shooting layups, warming up, and I, I came real close to throwing up. The Rebel baseball team won its three state championships in 1957, 1970, and 1973. The 1973 team was coached by Gary Musket, who had been a player on the 1957 championship team. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize about Coach Gary Musket is that he had a part in all three state championships teams at Emma Sansom in baseball. He was only a player on the 1957 team and then he coached the 1970 and 1973 state championship teams. In 2006, the members of the 1973 team got together in Gadsden for a much anticipated reunion. I think when we came back for the reunion and all the guys got together and you see them coming in to the, to the restaurant where we were having the reunion, and you, first thing you recognize, I guess, is the hairlines that have gotten a little thinner and the, the waistlines and the baseball stories have gotten larger. When Coach Musket started talking about the state championships teams that he had coached, he said the one thing that stood out in his mind most about the 73 team was how well we played together as a team. We weren't as talented as the 1970 team, but he said that the thing that he knew about our team where he would have such an impact on the baseball program was how we played together and we were just a, a complete team played together. Thanks to generous donations by many people, each team member was presented with a state championship ring to commemorate that championship season. One of the things that we did at the baseball reunion when we were putting this together was we, we talked about the fact that back when championships were won in, in, in our era and, and before, and even some since, uh, baseball rings were not given. Uh, we received a small plastic trophy uh, for our accomplishment and uh, we got to talking about something that would be a real memory for the guys. And so when we got together and started playing this, one of the things that we wanted to raise money for was to buy the guys a state championship ring. And this is uh, one of the rings that we were able to give the guys at the reunion. 
As the years went by, the Emma Sansom Athletic Department would also see the rise in prominence and participation in women's sports like basketball, softball, and volleyball, and enjoy continued growth with the addition of golf, tennis, soccer, and other sports. During my tenure as a uh, girls uh, basketball coach, the first uh, girl signed a college scholarship mm -hmm. under my tutelage and uh, Coach Patsy Hamilton. Mm -hmm. She was a head uh, varsity coach and I was assistant head. Coaches say the key to the growth and success for Sansom Athletics was cooperation. Buster really invited me into the dressing room to talk. That's correct. And he would do, I'd do likewise with him, but we were just closely knit. Yes. I find it interesting that a lot of coaches in high school, uh, I won't call any names, but they try to keep the basketball separate from the football. Right. Yeah. And that that's, that's a no-no. You've got to have good administration that works with the coaches, and the coaches work with them more importantly. You know. But you've got to have that relationship too. If you don't have that, uh, with, the, with your administrators, you're in trouble too. Being an athlete at Emma Sansom High School was about more than winning and losing. It was about being a part of a family. Most of the people we interviewed for this video talked about that. They talked about how the Emma Sansom family was important to them and how Emma Sansom High School was important to their family. Athletes talked about their dads and their granddads and how they had played football or baseball or basketball at Emma Sansom. They talked about the need to continue that winning tradition as a way of honoring those people who went before them and as a way of honoring Emma Sansom High School. As we've said before, the name Emma Sansom High School is synonymous with athletic excellence. In 1935, Colonel Frank A. Reagan succeeded George W. Floyd as principal of Emma Sansom High School. It was under Colonel Reagan that the school's first band was organized. Parents and students held many fundraisers in order to buy instruments and uniforms for band members. The school's first full-time band director was Mr. Lamar Triplett, and it was while Mr. Triplett was director that the Emma Sansom High School Band won their first state band championship. That first state championship was only a prelude to more than seven decades of musical achievement by the Emma Sansom Rebel Band. In 1958, Emma Sansom High School moved from its original site next to Black Creek to the site of Gulf Steel Junior High School, which had been built in 1936. Gulf Steel Junior High School moved to the original Emma Sansom building and was renamed General Forrest Junior High School in honor of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. In 1981, a new Emma Sansom High School was constructed in the shadows of the original building that had been Gulf Steel Junior High. The old building was torn down, and Emma Sansom High School became the newest and most modern high school facility in the Gadsden City School System. Once the decision was made to consolidate Gadsden's three high schools in 2006, a beautiful cast aluminum historic marker was dedicated and placed in the median of Megan Boulevard near the Sansom Family Cemetery. This special purple marker, with gold lettering of course, depicts all three of the buildings that carried the name Emma Sansom High School. The marker also contains the words to the Emma Sansom alma mater. We're right in the middle of Megan Boulevard where several Emma Sansom monuments and markers are. This marker behind me was dedicated in 2006 by the Emma Sansom High School Half Century Club, a group of alumni who graduated more than 50 years ago. They decided that there needed to be a special historical marker for Emma Sansom High School. They got together, they raised the money, and the city of Gadsden installed it in 2006. Mary Ann Clayton, Emma Sansom's last principal, opened the dedication program. Hoyt St. John had the invocation, and former principal Terry Harris introduced the guest speaker, Mr. Larry Johnson, the great-grandson of Emma Sansom. The placing of the marker was spearheaded by the Emma Sansom Half Century Club, an organization of Emma Sansom High School students who have been graduated for more than 50 years. Richard Brooks, the chairman of the Half Century Club's Commemoration Committee, recognized other committee members, including Emmett Cornett, Ben Pillitary, Vernell Thurman Bowen, James Payne, Harold Gross, Ida Jo Fricks Pillitary, and Betty Daniel Pruitt. The marker was placed as a lasting memorial to all of those who attended Emma Sansom High School and their contributions to the community.
When you talk about students at Emory Sanderson High School, of course, in my opinion, they were the greatest students ever came about, you know, ever lived. I've always been a rebel. I guess I always will be. <laughs> Well, it's just that I feel real sad that we're no longer going to have an Emma Sansom High School, but I think that the Emma Sansom family will continue to stay together, okay. and so the memory will never be lost. It's family, of course. Um, we just, just talked to, my mother was a Cronut, so I'm one of the Cronuts. <laughs> she went to Sansom, and uh, both me and my brother and my husband, my two children graduated from Sansom, so we have a history there. I'm all Sansom, yes, you don't know. You know what I mean? Not only my dad, but my mom graduated from Sansom too. And and then our three children also graduated from Sansom and his dad graduated from Sansom. So we were raised we were raised as rebels in purple and gold. We went to hear our parents talk about it, how you know they just couldn't wait to play guys at home and you know, just wanted to be them so bad and we uh, we passed by there and look over there. <laughs> exactly. So and, and that just created that rivalry mm -hmm. that much more so, so I hadn't thought about it, but that made me gross. I think Buster's daughter one time told me that her dad made them hold their nose when they went by gas and high. <laughs> they couldn't even smell the air. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> The member of Emory Sanson will always be a member. They can't take that member away. That's right. Remember that. Always. I love Sanson, and I always do. I just end it with that. The trash has been removed and all the people are gone, but on May 6, 2006, more than 4,000 people gathered here on Wall Street in downtown Alabama City to celebrate 75 years of Emma Sansom High School rebel tradition. We had bands, we had music, we had entertainment, we had concessions, and most of all, we had our entire Emma Sansom rebel family. 75 years of Emma Sansom rebels, more than 4,000 people strong, partied into the night on Wall Street in Alabama City with a big Emma Sansom Rebel final block party celebration. On May 6, 2006, the Emma Sansom Alumni Committee and an army of volunteers arrived early to begin preparations for the final farewell celebration, a spectacular block party in historic downtown Alabama City at the intersection of Wall Street and Sansom Avenue. Wall Street has seen many momentous events since the founding of Alabama City, but none more heart-rending and emotional than the one that was about to take place. The planning had all started in June of 2005, and now, with many months of planning and preparation behind them, the Emma Sansom High School Rebel Countdown Committee and all the volunteers were anxious to get the party started. A homecoming-style parade was scheduled to kick off the festivities at noon, so the vendors began arriving just after daybreak, setting up booths filled with Rebel memorabilia, food, and various other merchandise to sell to what was expected to be a large crowd of alumni and friends. By 9 a.m., city officials had blocked all the main traffic arteries leading to the intersection of Wall Street and Sansom Avenue, and the major setup work began in earnest. Mr. Rip Reagan, who is probably the most recognized alumni of all, was out early helping set up the main stage, which was donated by his Gadsden State Show Band, which would be performing later in the day. With a chance of rain in the forecast for the evening hours, the Rebel Countdown Committee soon had a tough call to make. Continue the preparations in Alabama City, or move the entire event to Convention Hall in Gadsden. The decision was made not to move the event, so Keith Tony and his crew continued their work and even erected a cover over the main stage to protect the entertainers from any rain that might decide to fall. In the meantime, volunteers were busy setting up the Emma Sansom Rebel memorabilia booth at the old Ritz Theater, which was all dressed up for the party and was sporting a brand new sign and marquee to welcome all the Rebels back home. 
The Countdown Committee's memorabilia booth offered everything from block party t-shirts emblazoned with General Forrest and Emma Sansom atop a white stallion to purple golf shirts with special Emma Sansom alumni logos. Rebel alumni could purchase a piece of history while helping to raise funds to cover the cost of the event. As parade time grew near, the crowd along Wall Street began to swell with former Rebels, many running into old classmates they hadn't seen in decades and reminiscing about the good times and yes, even some sad times, but none sadder than the closing of their alma mater after serving the community for 75 years. So many traditions, so many years of friendships. It's, it's really sad. It ain't not going to be the same without it. We're really going to miss uh, Sans and the purple and gold. Um, it's just really heartbreaking, but we're looking forward to the new school too because I know they're going to have a lot of opportunities. But uh, always a sense of rebel, you know. Just gonna miss it. Hundreds of rebels and a few curious bystanders strolled along the streets and sidewalks, patronizing the stores and vendors while awaiting the big parade. By mid-morning, the crowd in downtown Alabama City had grown to several hundred people, with many staking out a favorite spot to watch a parade that was still two hours away. As the parade's start time approached, the staging area became a beehive of activity and purple and gold the colors of the day. Some alumni classes decorated cars and trucks for the parade, others chose to walk or ride on floats, and everyone was decked out in their best purple and gold and letting their rebel pride shine for all to see. Class of 1947, Ember Satsum High School. And uh, uh, I was an assistant principal there for a number of years, and I loved every day of it. Emma Sansom High School has meant a great deal to the city. The heritage, the tradition, the spirit of the people of Emma Sansom, Alabama City, has made Gadsden the great city that, that we are. Class of 1947, great class. Dennis Holloway, class of 1989, was the parade director. According to Dennis, more than 60 units lined up to participate. The parade was officially kicked off by then Gadsden Mayor Steve Means, who served as the parade's Grand Marshal and rode in the lead car alongside longtime Rebel football coach and alumnus Buster Gross. Following close behind were vehicles occupied by many of the legends from the school's storied academic and sports past. Names like Terry Harris, Ben Pillitary, Sherman Guyton, and even former homecoming queen in 1947's Miss Alabama, Peggy Elders Butler. With sirens blaring and horns honking, the procession slowly made its way down Wall Street through a virtual sea of yelling and screaming Emma Santum alumni and supporters, waving at parade participants and shaking anything they had that was purple and gold. Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins whose families had attended Emma Santum High School for many generations stood together with tears in their eyes as the award-winning rebel band marched by one final time. No true rebel could hold back their emotions as the band played the legendary Emma Sansom rebel fight song one last time. As the parade ended with actors portraying General Forrest and Emma Sansom, many of the parade watchers expressed their sadness at the closing of an era. 75 years of Emma Sansom rebel history was coming to an end right before their eyes. Once the parade had ended and all the tears had been dried, it was time to put aside the sorrow and begin the celebration of 75 years of rebel history. Gadsden Mayor Steve Means kicked off the opening ceremonies with a few words of appreciation for how much Emma Sansom High School and her many alumni had meant to the city of Gadsden through the years. Where your parents live when you're little. You know that? You can't help it. My parents lived on the other side of the creek and I went to the other school. I couldn't help that. But I'll tell you one thing, I would have been honored to be a Sansom rebel. Yeah. This school, this school means so much to me. When I was just 10 or 11 years old, my mama had me playing drums and stuff, and she loved music. She informed me and my daddy one day that she was taking me to New York City with the Emma Sansom rebel band. 
we got on a bus and headed to the National VFW competition. And I was just a young kid and I was just thrilled. An impression that has stuck with me and an inspiration for the rest of my life. The next year, because that was the third time I think y'all had won that rip, said, well, we're going to go to California. We get on a bus, we work with the band boosters, and I'll tell you, I have never seen a group as organized and dedicated and committed as Emma Sansom High School band boosters were then and probably still are now. Raised tens of thousands of dollars, sold everything in that lunchroom every weekend, raising money for the band. We get on the bus, and I'm a pretty small guy back then, and I'm asleep in the uh, luggage compartment. Y'all remember when they had the old luggage compartment over a Greyhound bus? And I'm asleep up there, and I wake up somewhere. Nobody's in the bus. I'm by myself, but music wakes me up. I get out of the bus and wander outside, and there is Rip Reagan standing on an abandoned boxcar in the middle of a desert somewhere saying, pick up those knees, point those toes. And they were playing in the middle of a desert. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Well, it paid off. They came back national VFW champions. Yeah. I'm going to close out with a little something that I wrote. I just, the words came to my mind. I wanted to put them down and, and share them with y'all today. A rebel never ceases to yell, whether from the heights of heaven or the depths of hell. Emma showed our boys in gray would cross the creek and fight the Yankees one day. Yeah. <laughs> Forrest was brilliant, and General Strait went down. So we built Emma a monument in the middle of town. Then we built her a school to honor her name, to honor her courage, preserve her fame. She helped General Forrest defeat the Yanks, so we built her a school on Black Creek's bank. Yeah. Yeah. A, re a rebel's yell never ceases. A rebel's spirit yeah. never decreases. You were what you've been and you are what you are. These things will never change till we've crossed the bar. Traditions change over the years, but the memories last, the laughter and tears. While some things end, new things begin. A city united joins hands with a friend. The war's long been over. Emma long passed away. But we remember her courage as we gathered today. Memories can't be erased with the closing of a door. But through love and tradition will be remembered evermore. Students, parents, teachers, and staff have made their mark which will last and last. Gadsden. The city of champions yeah. would have never gotten that name if it weren't for the Sansom Rebel Band of VFW yeah. Championship Fund. Yeah. Now we're one. Welcome, GCHS. Our future depends on you. We wish you the best. Hold fast Sansom's values, tradition, and spirit, for the future of our city depends on it. When Johnny Reb waves goodbye, with faith in our future and a tear in our eye, we will say not goodbye, but a hearty farewell. For the spirit of Sansom will always dwell in our hearts, in our unified city. Thank you, Emma Sansom High School and Alabama City for making Gadsden the city of champions. I love you. Have fun. Rebels rule. As part of the opening festivities, a number of important guests from Emma Sansom's past were recognized for their contribution to school. Buster Gross and Ben Pillitary, who needed no introductions. Danny Kimball, a great student and athlete who has spent many years as a coach and educator in the Gadsden school system and went on to become the first athletic director for the new Gadsden City High School. It is great to be an Emma Sansom Rebel. There was Mary Ann Clayton, who was the first female principal of Emma Sansom High School and was the school's last principal as well. Sherman Guyton was introduced. Sherman coached and taught school for several years, then went on to become highly successful in the real estate business and was elected as mayor of the city of Gadsden in the summer following the celebration. The day's entertainment began with Rip Reagan and the Gadsden State Show Band. 
Mr. Reagan thrilled the crowd with his trumpet playing and storytelling while the band played many of the crowd's favorite tunes and even performed a few dance numbers. One of the featured performers during the show band set was Christian Hawk, a 2006 Emma Sansom graduate and the school's final homecoming queen. The show band's performance turned out to be a very special and touching way to kick off the busy day of entertainment for all of Emma's rebels, especially since Mr. Reagan was leading the band once more. When the Gadsden State Show Band finished, the scene shifted to the main stage on Sansom Avenue, and the large crowd welcomed the band Truck. After Truck came Ballyhoo. As the stage was being set for the next band, the large group of volunteers who were responsible for making this special event successful was recognized for their dedication and countless hours of work they had put in during the previous months of preparation. Then a group of alumni from the early and mid-70s took the stage by storm. It was the first live performance by Smokin' in almost 30 years, and they did not disappoint the crowd. Bill Gore, Terry Tadpole Williams, and Bud Bourne sounded as if they had never stopped playing together. As the last few notes of Smokin's performance drifted away, night began to fall on Alabama City, and an air of excitement began to move through the crowd in anticipation of the evening's next performer, the legendary Willie Hightower, a former member of the Drifters and one of the most well-known musical talents to ever come from Gadsden, Alabama. Willie and his band set the crowd to dancing with some of the biggest hits of the 60s and even allowed some crowd participation. By the time Willie said goodnight, event organizers estimate that the crowd had grown to somewhere between five and 7,000 people. But even after a hot day full of music and dancing, the crowd was still raring and ready to go for the night's main event, the headline performance by The Ten Times. The Ten Times group was formed back in the 60s by alumni from both Emma Sansom and Gadsden High. Lead singer Jerry Rickles, keyboard player Ronnie Cornutt, and drummer Lanny Thomas are all Emma Sansom alumni. As a matter of fact, almost every band that performed that night featured at least one Emma Sansom rebel in their lineup. As the Ten Times took the stage, the corner of Wall Street and Sansom Avenue came alive with people dancing and singing along with favorite hit songs from three decades of rock and roll. After several songs, the band took a short break so that the gathered crowd could enjoy a huge fireworks show. Thanks to Tony Nichols, this spectacular fireworks show was choreographed to remastered recordings of the Emma Sansom Rebel Band made back in the 1960s. Taking a look around the crowd, one would see that, once again, there weren't many dry eyes as the reality of the celebration really began to kick in. The rebels were saying goodbye to their alma mater, and her 75 years of tradition was coming to an end. As the fireworks ended, the Corps of Volunteers responsible for the production of the block party was introduced again, and a proclamation from the Alabama State Legislature, sponsored by State Representative Craig Ford, was read and presented to the block party committee. State of Alabama House of Representatives, Montgomery, Alabama, Resolution HR 19, by Representative Craig Ford, commending the Emma Sansom High School Alumni Block Party Committee for its outstanding contributions. Whereas, on May 6, 2006, students, parents, staff, faculty, alumni, and friends will gather to honor the closing and history of Emma Sansom High School, and, in recognition thereof, it is deserving of special recognition and heaviest uh, congratulations by the people of the state of Alabama, and, whereas, making sure this is a memorable event, are the 2005-2006 Emma Sansom High School Alumni Block Party Committee, including Charles E. Farley Smith, class of 1957, Clint Ellison, class of 1973, Mary Hyde Kelly, class of 1976, Tim St. John, class of 1977, Tammy Johnson, class of 1978, Carrie Payne, class of 1980, Rita Lynn Smith Tony, class of 1980, 
and Dennis Holloway, class of 1989. The party then continued as the 10 times returned to the stage for a few more songs to wrap up the night. As the last notes of music echoed down Wall Street and the stage fell silent, 75 years worth of Emma Sansom Rebels said their reluctant goodbyes, and the rain that had worried organizers earlier in the day finally began to fall. Councilman Ben Reed. Councilman Reed. Just off of Wall Street in downtown Alabama City, we've invited several of our Emma Sanson Rebel friends to join us today, and we're going to go inside and visit with them. <laughs> Tripping on the step. All right, we'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll take real. Here we go. 